here we are with Maka the Terror White. How we do, my man? Yes. How are you finding quarantine? Uh, it's not too bad, mate. Keep yourself busy, don't you? Do what you can. I live in a flat as well, so I ain't even got a garden, so... Get about an hour a day. <laughs> Shadow boxing really in the hard, kitchen. Yeah. yeah, pretty much, mate. Just pretty Barmy much. Misses. Yeah, I think I'm doing the red in a bit now as well. So, before we get into your journey, let's talk about UFC 249, the current COVID fiasco. So, you put yeah. something quite interesting on social media. Why, yeah, you, why, yes. Yeah, why do you think it should be off because of COVID-19 for um, the Jacare Souza fight? Ooh. Jacare. Uh, I don't know. I think it's just a big... Are they going to retest everyone now before the fight? Because they've probably passed it to fucking most of the fighters now. Dana White's probably got it himself. Is he going to leave? Is he going to stay away? No, doubt that. I mean, my point to this, because as controversial it is to say it should still go on, I feel like they all know the risks and they all know what they're getting in for. And they've all, you know... Yeah, all still... signed up to it. Well, this is it. It's not like it's a case of anyone's <laughs> in the dark about it. No, nah, yeah. That's a good point, I suppose, when you, uh, when you say it like that. It's Someone just... else has just said something interesting to me as well. They said, I guarantee they'll get their money's worth and then... Come in a week's time, you'll have five or six more fighters all test positive for it. So, I don't know. I think it's just... They should have tested them at the start of the week and then put something in place so that there's no chance of them getting it. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. I think it's the travelling and everything, but I don't know. The thing as well on top of that is they've had the weight cut as well. Like He's already made the weight up for all that to not be able mm. to fight. If you're Tony Ferguson, you've made it twice in what three weeks or whatever <laughs> <laughs> fuck that so let's talk about your journey so how did you get into mma in the first place uh i don't know really mate i was never i was never into martial arts as a kid never did anything up until i started with russ i think i was like in high school 15 14 something like that and i just seen it on telly and i thought yeah that's pretty cool i wouldn't mind doing that it was I wouldn't even say it was because I didn't really know all about respect and everything that was involved with martial arts at the time. I was pretty much like, yeah, it'd be cool to be that guy that gets in there and fucks with another guy, beats him up and all that. But I don't know when I got into it, I started with a, I started with a private session with Russ, with my brother, and then my brother was like, my brother's lazy as fuck. Basically, didn't want to do another. <laughs> And then I got Brad, Brad come with me. And then it just started from there, really. And then Russ finally got me into the into the classes because I was that guy that was like, I want to get fit before uh, before I do oh, it. Oh, one of them ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But now, and it just took off from there. I think I had my first fight about six months, six months into it. The bloke wasn't, not, not to be disrespectful or anything, <laughs> but he was. Here we go. He, he, sh he shouldn't really have been in there, to be honest. I don't think he's fought since. He was a pretty old guy and just, I don't know, but got you're me a win, so. You're a Got me off to a flyer. <laughs> so talk us through that first fight then. So you've got your fight booked. What was your initial feelings? Were you excited? Were you scared? How did, what, what was that like? I wasn't actually nervous at all, which was which surprised me a bit. I get more nervous now than I did before. For my first fight and stuff, I think it's because I didn't know what to expect. But um, I was meant to fight someone else, but it turned out fight week we found out he was like, I think he was like 15 and I was 18, and they were happy to do it. But I was a bit like, I don't really want to fight it. it. He's to me, he was a child, like he was, he wasn't even 16 and I was 18, and I wasn't really happy with that. And then they found me this, this Michael Reader guy on fight week and yeah just I weighed in I think he weighed in at like 56 kilo I weighed in at 61 so he was well Ooh. under yeah why is he I fighting a bantamweight <laughs> I don't know mate I don't know he was skin and bones to be fair so it that's just... an interesting point there you were fighting at 61 at that point what was your weight cut like non-existent because <laughs> my first fight I didn't want to I didn't know much about weight cuts or anything back then I just thought I think I weighed at like 62 and I had to get to 61 and I was worried about that at the time. I was like, oh, how, how, do I, how do I lose this kilo and that? And now I like, I cut like probably three kilo the night before now at most, which is still pretty small relative to some fighters like yourself weighing in at 66 last time. 
Mm. But um, <laughs> don't but, think about that. It's gonna be up. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and why didn't bang on the money first fight, and I haven't missed weight since. It's it's an easy weight for me to make. I think if I was to drop down to fifty seven, I'd struggle, and I'd, I want to enjoy my camps. I don't want to turn them into weight loss. Well, this is what we sort of touched on beforehand in training that it gets too much, becomes detrimental. Like, I don't know if I try to make 61, <laughs> I don't know how that would go down. No. And, like, again, if you're 57, because 61, you've got strength and you've got you know, that kind of pace and that kind of power. Whereas, I feel like if you went down to 57, you'd be too concerned with gassing out, yeah. too concerned with, like, you know, holding up. Yeah. So, it's an interesting concept, anyway. So, your next fight was against Rob. So, you've gone yeah. from your first win you know you're thinking of the fucking man and then <laughs> walking around the way hey i'm a cage fighter girl don't worry yeah. and, then, uh, <laughs> and then you end up you know that fight against rob and then afterwards what was your yeah the fight against that? Rob. I, thought I was i think i was due to fight someone else on that as well and i think either someone pulled out against rob or we both had pull outs or something like that and they asked me if I wanted to do it, and it was only my second fight. And obviously, like you say, I just won. I was on, on cloud nine and all that. I thought, fuck it, yeah, I'll fight him. And then I just got absolutely wrestled to death for four rounds and submitted in the last. Like, but but it's a big learning curve for me. It didn't get me. Obviously, it, it got me down a bit, but I knew the task I took on. I knew it was a real big, big fight for me. And and after a couple of weeks of moaning, I kind of come to terms with it. And then I thought, right, I need to start working on my ground game a bit more. Because I ain't, I ain't having that again, like. Well, that is interesting, though, that kind of maturity with it. That I think some of that comes from the performance side. I feel like if you got, like, outclassed by someone in the first, like, round or whatever, you'd feel a lot worse, feel like I didn't get a chance to get started. Whereas if you, you know, put on a good performance, especially at the level you were at versus the level Rob was at at that point, yeah, I can't help but feel, you know, you sort of did yourself a good service with that. To then yeah, that's learn it. From it. There's always a silver lining, I suppose. Definitely. Now, there's a few other um, interesting fights in your topology. I'm not going to pretend I've got a kind of, you know, <laughs> memory yeah. of everything. No. But no. include a couple of guys who are now pro. So you've got Faisal Malik and you've got Nick Bagley. Yeah. What, how, what, what happened with those fights then? Because obviously that kind of, they're level now. And, you know, yeah. you, I remember those fights. You were giving them an absolute war. <laughs> At yeah, there's how come you took those matches? Because surely at that point, I think Faisal was a brown belt. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. I thought I was ready for it at the time. Probably looking back on it now, I think I think because I'd had um, after Rob, I think I went on a four fights, four fight win streak. Mm. You can't you can't go on a four fight win streak and then to me anyway, this is how I thought of it. I can't be on a four fight win streak and then they offer me someone. I'll be like, mm, no, I'm not at his level yet. Do you know what I mean? I'm riding high, I'm winning four fights, I could have felt like I'd beat anyone. I thought, fuck it, let's go. I got offered Faisal, and then while I was in that camp, I was offered Nick Bagley as well for Fight Star, which was four weeks after Faisal. And I just said yes to that as well. And I think the Faisal fight again, his wrestling was real slick. Every time I went to throw something, he was on it. We knew, we knew, we knew that would be his game plan. And uh, we had a game plan to counteract it, but as soon as I got in there, I just went straight for the headhunting, like, and he took me down within 30 seconds, I think. And I think, again, that was the fourth round, third round or fourth round he submitted me. Just a little mistake. But, yeah, I didn't didn't get too beat up on that. Cracked on straight back into training. Didn't take any damage or anything like that. And then fought Nick four weeks after. And then again, he just just out wrestled me. I felt comfortable on my feet. I had a bit. I had a few positives to take from that fight. Like that was the first fight with Nick. I felt um, a lot more relaxed in there. I was throwing my shots. I was thinking about stuff. Once he threw a few shots at me, and thought, oh, it's not as like I'd watched his YouTube videos and he looked shit out. He was taking people's heads off left, right, and centre. <laughs> and then when I got in there and he threw a few shots in there, I thought, oh, it's not too bad. I can keep my distance and stuff. And then um, just as I started to get comfortable, bang wrestled me took me to the ground and just then on i think it was probably second third fifth majority of the fourth he was just on top of me i couldn't move 
real strong, real big guy for that weight. I was class. Say he's a barrel. <laughs> yeah, he's a machine to be he's fair. But then after that, then going to fight Alan Barron. So talk us through that camp. So you just had two back-to-back losses, which you know, arguably good performances still, but you know, end of the day, it's still a loss, and you still yeah. take it a bit of a you know, chip to your ego. How did you feel in that camp going for your third fight, potentially a third loss? Yeah, I was um, after those two fights. Actually, it was a bit of a downward spiral for me. I lost them, um, and then it was Christmas, so I used that. I had a bit of a time off and stuff, but I was due to fight in April. I think 2018. We're talking now, which would have been after my two losses, and then that camp, I was just like real down all the time. And I thought it was for the two losses. I think they had a big part to doing it, but like. I didn't really want to train. I was probably real close to quitting, just giving it up, just because them two losses, really. Even though I took positives away from them, overall, they really beat me up. Like, I, I didn't even want to go to work or anything like that. Didn't really want to get out of bed. I had good days and stuff, but it took me a while to get back into the full swing of things. And then um, I think August time, we started training properly again. I just... I just had a few months at the start of the year just to enjoy training, not worry about a fight, get back to being myself. And then, um, yeah, I think when we was ready, August, September time, Bray from Almighty was putting on show in York. And I've wanted to be on Almighty for a long time. If you've seen that belt, it's fucking lovely. I thought, right, I need to get on that. I need to try and get that belt. And um, started camp for Alan, knew he was a bit of a grappler. So I just I I started with a boxing coach then. I really wanted to really wanted to improve my footwork and speed my hands up, try and get some power behind them and stuff. So I started with my boxing coach Mark Gibbs. He literally one to one. He's got a little garage, probably twelve foot by ten foot, something like that. Real old school, like just simple techniques all the time, perfecting my hands. And yeah, I went to fight Alan. Camp went really well. Started with Crusader as well, Jacob. Shout out, I'm Jake. sure. Yeah, yeah. He's been I've been mentioned a few times on here, I think. But yeah, and that camp was just probably my best ever. I I think going into the fight I felt like he could not beat me in any way, shape or form. And I just stayed on the feet and just outboxed him. Yeah. Well, this is quite interesting as well, something you touched on there. I feel like when you have these fights and you get in the world of being an MMA fighter, you sort of identify yourself as that. You stop becoming Maka, you start becoming an MMA fighter. So when you start losing, you then think, am I even that anymore? And you lose track mm. of who you really are. So to have that break and that kind of, I want to say depression really, because that's what it sounds like, that kind of, you know, lack of motivation, lack of everything, lack of, yeah. you know, to then, you know, reassess and then rebuild is just, takes that extra sort of substance to really just to steer into it really because a lot of people can just you know go back into camp and then just ignore it but no to actually address that I mean it must have taken a lot yeah it was it was real tough time for me to be fair and like I had a few weeks off work and just I don't think I trained for those few weeks either I just did other stuff that I enjoy uh spent time with my missus I think I went fishing a few times with my dad and just and just uh, focused on enjoying life in general rather than thinking, right, I need to get back into this win. I need to I need to be better than... Even though I knew I needed to be better, I needed to improve on stuff. I wanted to focus on stuff outside of fighting just to make life better in general rather than making it better for fighting, if you know what I mean. Oh, definitely. And you start enjoying yourself and start, you know, reminding why you're doing fighting for, like, you're not yeah, getting fucking it. paid for it, right? <laughs> nah, it. especially amateur, you're doing it because you love it. Exactly, that's you're what you need to remember. The experience and, and when you go pro, that's when you start. Obviously, I take it serious now. I'm at that high, I'm at that higher end of the amateur circuit. I'm, I'm, I'm probably looking to go pro in a few more fights. But you still got to enjoy it. If you stop enjoying it, what's the point in doing it? You're forcing yourself to do something you don't really want to do. And I think that's when, for me anyway, I think that's when I um, I really I really started to struggle with my depression and stuff is because I was forcing myself to do something that at the time I was a bit like, why the fuck am I doing this? Like I had to force myself to train. 
And then I'd be arguing with myself because I thought, I love this, this is what I want to do, but something else was telling me to, what the fuck are you doing this for, do you know what I mean? And taking that time away, even if it's just a couple of weeks, if you start to feel like that, I recommend just take a couple of weeks away. And then when you start to miss it, that's when you think, yeah, I'm ready for this again now. I think certainly when it comes to a fight camp in itself, apart from the physical side, emotionally, you're so invested in it. So it's not just, okay, it's a fight, you see it, and that's the end of that. No, it's you're putting all this camp, you're putting all this energy into this one moment in front of everyone to see, this is honest, this is vulnerable, and then it doesn't pan out. It's heartbreaking, regardless of how you perform whatever else, it still is a heartbreaking experience. And to then try and rebuild and then it happened again, it's just so just demoralizing. Yeah. To then get yourself in a position to do that, you need to be able to build yourself up to be potentially broken back down again. Yeah. And again, it's that extra layer behind it saying if all you've got is fighting, when you lose the fight, then what? And then to remember, because there's a couple of examples of this is where you see people who become full time athletes who don't do anything else besides fighting. And that kind of weight you put on it, just I can't help but feel it just makes you burn out. Whereas the people who still either have part time or full time jobs or something outside of it <clears throat> can help have a bit of divide, a bit of a mental break, and a bit of, you know, there is more to life than yeah. it, but you're still, you know, giving taking it seriously. There's a fine line with it all. Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of fighters they um they wanna give that image where it's like this is fighting, this is my life, this is all I want to do and that and, and for me I do want to do it full time, but like you say, you've got to you've got to have something else. So when you do have those down moments from fighting, you've got something that you can you can go and enjoy or something that can take your mind away from the losses or the shit training sessions or the, the harder weeks and all that. Well this was something quite interesting to talk about, saying so, at the gym as well, were you able to sort of confide in people with the way you were feeling about this kind of things? Were you quite open about it with people around you? Were you just like, oh, no, nah, I just don't want to train, and that was in the conversation? Was there? Oh, no, nah, no, nah, nothing like that. Like, you, um, like Brad was saying on his on his podcast, shout out Brad. to Brad. <laughs> <laughs> um, down our gym, Russ's, it's, it's, it's more of a family environment. It's not a, it's not your typical fighters gym. We haven't got twenty plus fighters all getting ready for fights all the time. It's, it's pretty much me and Brad, and Mason on the upcome now. There's another young Shout lad, there, Mason. Mitchell. <laughs> yeah, there's another young lad, Mitch, and, and we've got a pretty, pretty beginners team, like. But, yeah, like I say, it's real close knit, and I think, um, I told Russ, Russ about how I was feeling before I even told even told my parents. I remember being in Russ's office and I just broke down and he was there. He was there for everything and obviously then I told Brad. But um Russ said to me when I was in the office, Russ said to me, if you don't go home and tell your mum and dad now, he said, I'll bring them up and tell them myself. <laughs> so then I had to go and tell my parents and speak to them about it and everything just started to look up from there really. So I mean, yeah, I had Brad, I had Russ. Uh, wow. And then, yeah, it's, it's the kind of gym it is. That's why, I, that's why I love it. That's why I'm still there today. I mean, that kind of duty of care from Russ as well, because like, I don't know, the fact that you were able to confide in him in that kind of way, in that kind of honesty, like, I think that really rings home the difference between a trainer and a coach and that kind of relationship you build. It's not just, okay, I go up to class, I do the what he asked me to do and I go home. No, yeah. you you invest in that person like emotionally, physically, everything, and to see it reciprocated like that for him to look out for you and then you know want what's best for you. I mean, as well for you to be able to open up about it because you know when you're in this sort of hole of depression, you don't want to talk about it. You don't want. I mean, it's different for everyone, but like as a yeah, for, for my our experiences, the way it sounds, it's very much like you know, you don't want to talk about it. You want to just, you go in your, your hole. You don't want to interact and all this kind of stuff. But then take that that leap of faith almost to speak to someone and be like, I just can't do it anymore. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it just it turns around. I think it's, um, for me, it was more, and even now, like, I still have my down days and stuff. Everyone does. It never goes anywhere. I think, um, 
a lot of the time, myself anyway, and probably a lot of other people just kind of brush it under the carpet and think, I'll be all right tomorrow. I'll just let it, I'll just let it go. I'll be all right tomorrow. And then all of a sudden, a couple of weeks down the line, if you keep doing that, it's just gonna, it's just gonna blow up and explode. Well, this is my analogy with this is because it's a managing thing. It's not how you fix it. It's no. like if you have an injury, the way you deal with it, you don't just tape it up and try and you know grit your teeth. No, what you do is you find out the rehab you need to do. You find out what you have to do to warm it up properly, how to cool it down properly, and you do that whenever you have to train. So, like with your mental health, for example, well, again, it's all case by case. I'm not going to generalize, no, but, no. but you find a way that you can deal with it properly. You could find a sort of system to try and deal with it. So instead of ignoring it, you can manage it. Because obviously everyone's going to have ups and down days. You're going to have the spikes and the highs and the lows. But you need to be able to process those moments. You can't let it overwhelm you the way it it can do. No, so- yeah, definitely. Definitely. So just to um keep on this timeline then. So you've had that really important win. How did that win feel? That for me was probably the best win since I started fighting really. Coming back, having having those two losses, having that big year. Cause I didn't, I, it wasn't till November. So coming into the fight, I hadn't fought for 11 months, something like that. So after having all that time off and then to come on. And when I stepped in there and I started, it felt like I'd never been away kind of thing. And I feel like that was my best performance. And a lot of people probably see that he wasn't as experienced as me. But before that fight, I actually asked if there was any other lads that were more experienced. I wanted a not a better opponent, but... A bigger test you know kind of I mean? thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the lad, there was another lad that offered me, but they said Alan had beat him. So, so yeah, And I'd watched enough. Alan's fight. I knew he was game and everything. And I think you can't really go on records all the time. It doesn't mean shit, especially at the amateur level. Well, it's so, case by case as well, yeah. It sort of it varies so much. Yeah. Yeah. You can have someone not in know that's fought fucking no one and they're dreadful. Or you can have someone that's four and four but they've fought everyone at the top of their weight weight class and just got unlucky, do you know what I mean? This is it. So with that fight in itself, so you've had this long layoff, you've had this real like emotional battle to try and get yourself to a position where you could train and get into a fight camp. So on the day, what was going through your mind in the sense of, you know, it's fight day when you get to the venue, you're warming up. What was your kind of process opposed to like your normal fight camps? Uh, it was a strange one actually, because um, obviously it was in York. So it was three and a half hours for me to get there. So I'd gone up the day before and I'd gone up with my partner and my best mate, Dean, he doesn't know shit about fighting. He's just he's just a good laugh. He's good Happy to be, to be there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of thing. I think he was drinking JD and Coke on fight day from 11 o'clock in the morning kind of thing. <laughs> but um, he was around. Jacob come up for the weigh-ins as well. And I think because cause no one was constantly asking me about fighting or anything, it was a pretty... Um, it was a different environment. Whereas it's nice to have your coach around, but sometimes they're constantly talking about the fight and, and you start to get into fight mode a bit too early. For me, that's how I feel. So just having, just having my missus and Dean around, I didn't really think about the fight too much until a few hours before. And then Brad and Russ got there and just like any other fight, really, warmed up. And then before I knew it, I was on. I think I was seven fights into the card. I'd asked to be a bit earlier. Because um, everyone had a long way to travel and travel back. So, got on a bit early, got it done, and yeah, loved every second of it. Got the win, and that was it. Now, this is a different take on this. So, say after that big significant win, how did it meet your expectations in having that, you know, I needed this moment, I've got it, to now what? Did you have that much of a fight of blues after that fight? No, I didn't actually. I didn't, no. I just, I think I tried to not put so much pressure on that fight. I didn't think of it as, I need this win. I've done all of this. I need to get this win. I just, I just thought of it as any other fight. And that was it. And then, again, I had another big layoff after that fight. Because, like, dickhead, 
Alan kicked the shit out of my leg. <laughs> and um, Shout out, Alan. I've, yeah, shout out, Alan. <laughs> Cheers, mate. <laughs> but nah, um, obviously that was late November, so then we had like the Christmas break. And I went back to training. I was still training over Christmas, as you do, but let's be honest, you don't train as much fight or not. You're going to yeah. eat shit and get, get a bit fat, have a few beers and that. But um, I went back to training properly January to get ready for to fight Andy Yates on Golden Ticket for their title. As soon as I started training, my leg was still that battered from the almighty fight. I had, um, I had a big hematoma and I couldn't even run. It would just swell up and I couldn't move my leg or anything. So I had to pull out of that one, which is a shame. I was really looking forward to that. Mm. But... Um, yeah, so that gave me another long layoff. And then we couldn't find the right date for me to fight again. And I didn't fight again until Marlon, I think, November 2019. Now, that's a thing I wanted to sort of touch on as well. Because I remember you saying about the Marlon fight is that you just didn't really seem to show up. So talk us through nah. your experience in the day and everything else, like the camp and all this. Camp camp was really good i had another really good camp and then i'd started going over to bst shout out bst yeah i it's it is it's hard for me to get over there i really like it it's a really good gym and i'd love to get over there more but that's an hour and a half for me i was traveling that so every week i was traveling there mondays and i'd try and get there on a friday as well i was just trying to get there as much as possible and I have my training with Jacob Tuesdays and Saturdays, all my uh, my boxing, all my training at Russ's. It was a really good camp, really good camp. Sparring with all the guys at BST, like yourself, Albania, Hadi, just real high level guys there. Lots of fighters, a lot of different gym than what I'm used to, and kind of what I needed. But um, yeah, come fight night, it was a weird one. Weight cut. I cut a bit more weight than I usually do for that fight. I think I cut four kilo the night before. And that didn't really help me, to be honest. But fight day, I just couldn't... I don't know if you've ever, ever had it yourself before, but, like, warming up, I just couldn't seem to get get ticking. I, I still wasn't in there kind of thing. I don't know. It was weird. I just went with it. I couldn't get into the zone. Couldn't get warm. Couldn't get sweat on when I was warming up. And... As I was walking out, I was I was screaming and shouting at myself, trying to amp myself up, but just nothing was there. And and when it started, I think whole camp, I didn't throw one head kick. I knew in this fight, if I threw a head kick, he's gonna take me down and expose like my weakness. I went, I'm not, I haven't got shit wrestling or anything like that, but it's not my strongest suit kind of thing. Mm. And um. And in the first 30 seconds, I threw an head kick. I remember thinking in the fight, what the fuck have I just done that? What a twat. And uh, and he was just ground and pounding me. And I still, I didn't have no sense of urgency to get out of it or anything. I was still not there. I couldn't hear my corner shouting or anything. I couldn't hear any instructions. And it was weird. And I think I woke up when he had his fucking arms around my neck. I was like, shit. Bit late now. <laughs> and then... And I think that that fight got me down again, pretty bad. Like like you said earlier, when you when you, you when you have a big fight, if you go the full fight and you give a good account of yourselves, you kind of get over it after a little bit and think, yeah, I lost, but it was a big fight. I give it my all. Whereas this fight, first round, I got took down, ground and pound for nearly three minutes and then he tapped me out in, in the last 15 seconds or something like that and I knew I knew that was not me at all and I felt like I had to try and tell people like I felt like people would have looked at that and gone he's fucking shit like and I felt like I needed people to know that wasn't me and then yeah that was just shit I moved on from that and Got on the Cage Warriors Academy card in March. I think that was probably one of the last cards this year before, obviously, all of this kicked off and everyone got locked inside. Now, that Cage Warriors card, the emotion 
Oh, talk, no. talk, talk me through that fight. Talk me through. Talk me through all. Was it ninety seconds of it? Talk... <laughs> yeah, I think it was a minute nineteen. I knew, like the whole camp, I knew Tom was like a kickboxer, and I knew that's what he wanted to do. It was funny actually because his last fight before we fought was against Marlon, and he lost to him in the first round by rear naked joke, just like I did. I think that's probably what sold the match for the matchmaker. He's like, can it get any more even? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, again, I had another good camp. All my work with Jacob, my boxing coach, Russes and Brad and everyone. And then obviously I, I was sparring with you and the guys down BST when I could. Sam Creasy, Tom Creasy, all of the, the high-level guys down there. And... um. Yeah, everything just went to plan. Fight fight week, I still felt great. There was no nerves at all. I was ready for the fight as well. Weight cut was sound. I think I had to cut like two kilo, something like that in fight week, two, three kilo. Nothing did, really. Um, yeah, I had Dean Kirk. Shout Dean Kirk. For, for, <laughs> for fight week there. I think I did the count myself. I'm pretty good with my nutrition, but I just wanted someone there for fight week. Just in case anything went peak tongue, everything went sound, weight was sound, I weighed him, bang on. And it was just the old cage warriors thing, I think. It was just nice to, I've wanted to do it for ages, ever since I started. And um, just getting them yellow gloves and how smooth everything was on fight day. I think you get a lot of the shows and sometimes they're a bit all over the place, but everything was just so smooth and... Um, I think I was third fight of the night, again, nice and early. A bunch of my mates come up, shout out to them. Shout out, mates. <laughs> and yeah, I fucking, even though I'd prepared myself for a bit of a stand-up war and I did want to go out there and bang and put on a real show for Cage Warriors, I think everyone wants to make a big impact when you get on there. But um, yeah, I just saw an opportunity to get him up against the wall. I wanted to grate him down a bit, wear him down. And then he actually um, he actually tripped me. And then I seen he left both his arms in and I went for an omoplata straight away. Of all things. Yeah, rolled about three times. And then ended up getting on his back and sinking in the choke. And I remember when I felt the tap. Oh, mate. It was just amazing. It's just amazing. I was screaming to the hills. I pushed my toe climbing up the cage like a dickhead. <laughs> That put me out of training for two weeks. That did proper <laughs> fucking toe up. But you know, I didn't care. You can see it as well from the video how excited you're. You climb the cage, you shout at yeah. the camera and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. I'm so happy to see the thing is because I think most of us were fighting the same day over in Birmingham. Yeah. So yeah, we were like actually w- watching each other's fights thinking, oh, is everyone all right? Is everyone all right? Yeah, <laughs> is everyone won? Fucking hell. I yeah, think was, everyone did no. win, to be fair. I think five out of us, five out of five of us won on Valerie. You won your cage warriors. Yeah. I don't think who else fought the same day, but yeah. What Mental. a time to be alive. So talk us through um, your first session at BST. How come you came over in the first place? Um, I think I followed a lot of the lads on Instagram. Seen the facilities and everything through Instagram, through Facebook and everything. And I don't know, it just, it just looked like the kind of place I needed. A lot more fighters to spar. A lot more knowledge being passed around. Not that not that there's no knowledge being passed yeah, around yeah, buses, yeah. but like I said earlier, it's pretty it's different. Pretty new to MMA, the gym is like and and I kind of help help with Brad now trying to bring on some of the younger guys and stuff and going over to BST two times a week or something, or like I say, whenever I can get there with all the experience and You've obviously got guys there fighting for the UFC now and Bellator and it's just having all of those like minded guys around that all wanna be at the same place, all on the same mission and just just getting all the knowledge you can out of them, all the experience, all them hard rounds. I've probably lost most of the rounds I've done there, but that's what builds you on it. That's what you're coming for. Now there's a few things I wanted to kind of touch on with that. Is Brad started training at Renegade? I'm just curious why you didn't end up going there as well. Obviously, being the more local option for a similar kind of level change. Um. Well, what it was for me is 
I didn't have beef from there before. Well, <laughs> little bit, sh- little bit shit was spoke to me before by one of the guys that used to train. Well, trains there or whatever. I'm not sure. So I just thought I don't, I don't want to go over there, be uncomfortable, and probably not be able to train properly in the right frame of mind, kind of thing. And and then as soon as I went over to BST and I, I got on with all the guys there, and they're all similar to me, kind of thing. And yeah, I just thought there's no no point in me going anywhere else now. I like it here. I like all the guys here. So yeah, it's an it's. It's an extra half an hour, and to be honest, getting into Birmingham on an evening is probably going to take me just as long to travel over to BST. I can get to BST in under an hour and a half now. So it's pretty hectic, don't get me wrong. I'll get home from work at half five, quickly eat my tea, and try and get over to BST for seven for a couple hours training, and then uh, drive back. I think I've been back home after midnight a couple of the nights. But we're fit. Well, that's the kind of commitment you need to like make with these kind of things. And also, it's not just necessarily the training commitments, but that kind of you've gone out your way for that training to know you're putting in that effort. You know you're in uncomfortable situation because comfortable would be going to the uh, the same gym all the time with people like a bit beginner sort of level where you could beat them and think, you know what, I'm the fucking man. Or you mm. can go out of your way inconveniently to train with professionals and, you know, guys of different levels like Big Dan Lester and, you know, those kind of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know what you're laughing at there. <laughs> nervous laughter, mate. I'm this is it. I'm quite intimidating, you see. <laughs> no, that's it. I think you've got to be committed to it. If you want to go far with it, you've got to be committed to it. I can't work eight till five. Monday to Friday and weekends every other weekend, but I get up, I do my cardio before work, get home from work, train a couple hours after work, every day pretty much. And if you ain't got that sort of commitment, you're not going to get to the heights you want to get to. Now, regards of your work, isn't it quite a physical job you do as well? Not really, not really, to be honest. I I'm an engineer, but it's pretty light stuff. It's just, it's more stressful on the brain. There's a few guys there that could just do with being a bit more, less stressful on my shoulders, but it's all good. It's all good. More mentally tiring than it is physically. Oh, political. Anyway, <laughs> move on swiftly before you have to find a new career. Before path. I get sacked. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Um, so most important question of the podcast, or second most important, you love your donuts. What's your favourite donut? What's your favourite flavour? Talk to me. Post pipe Damn. donuts. It's got it's gotta be Krispy Kreme, innit? They're just they're readily available and they shit all over any Tesco bakery donut. Oh, if anyone beef. comes at me with Tesco bakery donuts, fuck off. I'm a Krispy Kreme guy. This now, guy. Biscoff, there we are. I wanted the details because Krispy Kreme is a wide spectrum. Yeah, oh. Biscoff, mate, number one. Number two, Nutella. And you can't go wrong with the classical original glazed. I love the smile on your face as soon as you start talking about this. You went <laughs> serious, you know, stoic. Like, you know what? I'm really struggling with stuff, but fuck it up. Biscoff. <laughs> yeah, mate. can't be done. It's been a while as well. It's been a while. This is it. I'm going to get emotional if we keep talking about it. Let's move on. This is it. So, one thing I wanted to kind of touch on as well is your camp structure. Because obviously when it comes to doing a bit of coaching, working, and nutrition seems to be quite cleared up on with regards of how your body works and what you need. To, but who does your fight camps? What do you mean, sorry? So who... what, what days you're doing what, how you strategize for an opponent, uh, and all this kind of stuff. Um... Nutrition, like I said earlier, I'm pretty. I've been doing it long enough now. I know my body works. I know what I need to fuel me for the days, and I treat myself now and again. We all do. I think I'd go insane if I never. But yeah, Monday, I get up, do a bit of cardio. Same all week. I'll try and do something before work. Half an hour cardio, something like that. An hour. Uh, if I can get over to BST on a Monday, I will. If not, I'll go to Russ's. Tuesday, I'll have Jacob head over to Black Country Barbell, Barbell, whatever, whatever you want to say. Barbells. 
<laughs> That's Christmas time. I'll get fucking people always picking up on my on my speech. Good thing you came on a podcast then, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. But um, yeah, Black Country Barbell. Go there with Jacob. Do the strength and conditioning work. Um, Wednesday, Russ's. Thursday, I have my boxing one to one. Then I go over to Russ's. Friday, again, if I can get to BST, I like to try and get there. And then um, I started doing the Sunday sparring at BST as well. When I can, again. But I work weekends as well. And I have another session with Jacob on a Saturday, sorry. And that's pretty much me for the week. Two hours a day minimum. And then if I need a rest, I'll just have a rest. Well, that's Any... an interesting point. That's all I kind of wanted to get at as well as that kind of balance between grafting and training smart and also listening to your body. Because when you're in fight camps, especially for like more significant fights, is that temptation to do more than you're already doing, which can in turn be detrimental instead of beneficial. Yeah. I I do pretty much work out seven days a week now. I do something every day. But like I say, if I need a rest, I'll just have a particular day off, whatever day. doesn't really matter to me. If I, I'll try and pick a day where I'm doing less stuff. Might just go for like a long walk or something. Just so I'm moving, but I'm not putting strain on my body. But um, obviously, with Brad being my coach at Russ's, he, he knows that as well. So if I tell him I'm going to have a night off, he's not going to be there like, oh, now, come on, you need to get into training, you need to do this. He understands because he's fighting himself. I think that's where it gets quite interesting as well, is where you get balance between our... I think because you've had that relationship, so to speak, <laughs> <laughs> that um, yeah, he knows that you yeah, treat thanks. yourself to the same sort of standard that you're, you're having a rest because you actually need it. It's not a case of, you know, you're just feeling lazy or that kind of thing. You're at that yeah. level of honesty. Whereas certain beginners, I can't help but feel, they need a bit of a push sometimes. They need a bit of a... You're not as tight yeah. as you think you are. Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. You need to um, find the fine line for them. You can you can kind of tell when someone's actually tired, or usually their excuse will give it away. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But rather than them just saying, "Look, I'm real tired. It's this week's really grinding on me. I'm gonna have the night off." They'll try and make up some shit excuse, like they gotta cut their hands grass or some something daft. <laughs> hey, it's important. Uh, okay, it tells uh, you what. Um, so. One fight day, what is your usual sort of routine, like mindset kind of thing? So obviously, you get to the venue, what is your, do you do a lot of visualization? Are you just quite chilled? Do you like all seriousness? What's your kind of preference when it comes to these fights and stuff? I like to stay pretty chilled myself, try and have a nap. Because usually the night before, you're kind of like a kid at Christmas, ain't you? You can't really sleep that well. Even though you lay in bed thinking, right, well, fucking go to sleep, you've got a big day tomorrow. You can't. So I'll try and just get to the venue early, get everything sorted, medicals and whatnot. And then I'll try and get backstage and just have a little, not necessarily a nap, just shut my eyes, put some music on quietly and just chill out, really. What about you? That's romantic. You're a serious guy. (laughs) You know me, I can't be a serious guy. (laughs) It's funny, though, because you kind of need to, because the problem I tend to find with fire, especially like start, was that difference between sparring and fighting and trying to find out how hard to really... I don't know, the way you train, the way you fight, and this kind of transfer. Because I'm trying to stay calm, trying to stay composed, but then I'm not throwing with the same kind of venom, or I'm too keyed up and I'm not relaxed enough. So it's a bit of a yeah. funny one. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I'm not one of those guys in the changing room who starts like shouting at himself, but, you know, I'm... Gonna... Scream, smashing his chest in and everything. <laughs> Sit punching the walls and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> the Josh Koscheck kind of moment. <laughs> yeah. That is another point. Who has been your sort of biggest influence in MMA? Because obviously initially you were giving it a go just for just for a laugh, if anything else, and then then switch it on and take it seriously and really want to, you know, have a good go of it. Um, I don't know really. I don't think. I, just, I used to, when I first got interested in it, I used to watch all the old school guys like BJ Penn, Forrest Griffin. I really liked Jose Aldo. 
when he was at his peak. Obviously, it was a bit shit seeing him slowly decline. And then when he lost to McGregor in 13 seconds, Jesus. But yeah, no, I don't. I wouldn't say there's any main inspirations in my in my MMA. Just the sport in general. I used to watch as much as possible old fights, current fights. Yeah, and just take, just use that to like push me on kind of thing and amp me up for it. Uh, one last thing before I let you go. What is one positive you've taken from quarantine and the whole COVID situation? <laughs> uh, spending the time with my missus, really. Oh, she's listening. So, <laughs> uh, she won't listen to this, mate. She can't listen to stuff like this. It makes her cringe. But, but um, your bases. yeah, nah, just just spending more time with her. Obviously, I can't, I, there's no one else about and I'm training all the time, so... We don't see each other as much as we probably should do, but I think I'm starting to get on her nerves a bit now, so <laughs> she'll probably be glad when it's over. I think that is so important, though, that what you just said there, that almost allocated family time, allocated time for your loved ones, because when it comes to life in general, not just fighting specifically, but you, everyone gets so wrapped up in what they're doing, you have to then make time for those around you. Yeah, as, you can as it makes of... sense, because, you know, your schedules and everything else, but then when it's made for you, it's, yeah, you appreciate it. It sounds it sounds bad. Like I don't want to sound. I don't want to make it sound like you've got to do it. Like it, I don't want it to sound like a chore. But you put in the position where there's nothing else to do, so you're kind of forced to spend time with each other that you don't get to usually do with all the training and working and everything else. So it's it's nice, yeah. Well, that's it. It's all allocated for you. Really, you sort of, someone's made that time for you to then spend with each other. Yeah. So, Maka, where can people find you? Uh, Instagram. Maka, let me just check it. Don't want to get it wrong. Maka underscore white MMA. And then I have got a Facebook page, an athlete page, but I don't really use it. So just Maka White, if you want to check that out. Thank you for listening, guys. And this episode has been sponsored by Mola MMA. Use code FCMMA20. At checkout on mallermma.com for 20% off on all products.